Molly Brown lives in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, and she is a poet, writer, and a former teacher. She says that she has been writing, editing, teaching, proclaiming, and instigating poems for so long she has stopped apologizing for it. <laughs> it is clear that Polly loves and breathes poetry, whether it's others or herself. She is a long-term member of the Every Other Thursday poetry group that gathers and helps to workshop one another's poems in the Boston area. She is also a teacher, a former teacher from Touchstone Community School, a private school uh, focused on uh, creative forms of learning with students. And um, in one mention on website I noticed uh, emphasizes the power of story. She is also a lifetime teacher. Polly has been teaching in many different circles of community. She has taught at the Worcester Art Museum, the Worcester County Young Writers Conference for Young People in Poetry, in private groups at various public libraries, including Hopkinton's. She has not only taught, but given her students valuable reading opportunities to share their own poetry. She has also directed the poetry side of the Hopkinton's Art on the Trail for the past two years. For her own, when she spends time on her own work of poetry, she has two published chapbooks, Blue Heron Stone and From Every Other Thursday Press, and Each Thing Torn from Any of Us from Finishing Line Press. And I believe she is working on the next one. She is also an activist out in the world, accustomed to protesting for what she believes in related to peace and justice. Like, has in the past, she has joined as often as she could the Tuesday Westboro Rotary Vigil, holding a sign saying, bring them home. Yeah. She, consequently, she has also collaborated um, and attended the Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences Summer Writing Conference at UMass in Boston, and is working now on new manuscripts from that that uh, experience. She has won awards for Worcester County Poetry Association contests and the Massachusetts Artist Foundation. And she is a Pushcart Prize nominee. Her recent poems have appeared in a number of journals as Appalachia, the Worcester Review, the anthology Birdsong, and online Antiphone. She has a blog, A Year to Think It Over. Uh, which is worthy of checking out. Um, as you will see, she is a lifelong teacher and has teaching and poetry coming through the veins of the internet. And here she is to share some of her poetry with you today. Please help me welcome Polly Brown. All right, do you need a little reminder? Give me the high sign if I'm going to Okay. So, thank you, Cheryl. I'm glad I saw all, those, all your wonderful faces before, because I can't see you at all, unless you're in the first row <coughs> now. Uh, so I was going to describe Cheryl's wonderful, generous, generous leadership. She leaves out how subversive she is, that she is a provocateur. You know, that she talks people into doing things they will wake up the next morning and be amazed at having done. So we're all the better for it. And I, I do want to say thank you to all of you who are here on a day when there are lots of other places to be. I, I too, am feeling grateful. And I'm going to try as briefly as I can to tell about the communities that the poems I read have risen out of. Be because poetry is something we do very much in solitude, but very much in community. My very first community of poets was my family. And I honestly thought that everybody's parents wrote poems, <laughs> you know, either 
very occasionally now and then the way my dad did, or, or much more faithfully and with a great deal of craft and persistence the way my mother did. I've been working on putting together a book of poems, selected poems, for my mom. Um, most of her poems have never been published. The earliest in the book were written in 1944, when she was 17. Mm -hmm. and, and she's now 89, and going, going through some changes. But talking about her poems inside the world of each poem, she, she can be wonderfully lucid still. So I'm going to read two spring poems, one by me, and Cheryl gave me permission to read one by her. This one is mine. It's called In Spring. Near a house site on the Westboro Road, in scrub woods and wild trout lilies by a new driveway, a small hand-lettered sign reads, well, most likely to tell the drillers they found the right place. But every morning I pass and the green world clears its throat. Well, and I wait for whatever the woods will say next, sooner or later, or since you mentioned it, or, in fact, you can see how I'm blessed by a common delusion that the world has been trying to get my attention, that it's been waiting for the right occasion, that even this morning it might reveal itself once more. And my mom's doesn't have a title. It's in a sequence called A Love Story. Where can we go? On a fickle day, mild over mud leaking, clutter piled snow, how can we celebrate the spring? I know a place where two could stoop and stare, struck by the curling of water in gutter, hazarding mud, stone, and stick boat against flow. As reborn, we grow to old knowledge. Give up your care and sing. Embrace the itch. Bring boots and share the damning of the ditch. <laughs> been doing this for a long time and by now I am a, a grateful member of too many overlapping poetry communities to be able to name them here. I started out to and then I thought no, I can't. Cheryl mentioned that my home base is a group called Every Other Thursday and the next poem gradually evolved into itself over a period of years with uh, ferocious and, and loving uh, support that sometimes feels like an attack. <laughs> <laughs> but they disagree with each other, and so you leave baffled and liberated. Um, uh, I, I cannot imagine my writing life without them. And, and then after submitting it for 
you know, again and again and again and again. Finally, I submitted it following a lead from Susan Edwards Richmond, whom I met here at Wake Up, you know, little networks of. And of course, the, the, the editors of an anthology like this are creating a little virtual community, right? A little conversation. In this case, of people writing about birds in very, very different ways. This is called Why We Found <coughs> Three Swallows. And it's, it's dedicated to Jeannie, who is my mom. Why We Found Three Swallows. Because the barn is neither outside nor inside, but that hybrid a barn swallow loves. Civilization with its triangles, <coughs> perpendiculars, heavy beams, the fine cleverness of grandfathers. But huge holes of doors where the wind and swallows enter and leave. Because they swoop in whenever the door is open and don't share any language we can use to tell them these doors are no longer open daily, but will close and stay closed. Because you are afraid of thieves if we leave the doors wide all week while you live alone. Because even if I use a long pole to break the small pots of their old clay nests, shards shattering far below on the wide board floor, still the, ch the swallows chatter joyfully to each other about any scrap at all left on the rafter, saying, yes, we could work with this. <laughs> because feathers turn to dust slowly, so slowly that several winters later, they still show the reddish brown of the throat and the long wings curving out and away. Because under this roof, this too can count as hope. So as a kid, I, I, I knew that there was a shadow over my family and I could not figure it out. And I became as committed as everyone else to pretending that it wasn't there. And this was a widespread condition known as the 50s. <laughs> But for me, it lasted longer. Um, and, and many, many chapters later, I heard about the, the Joyner Institute. Um, the study of war and social consequences. I don't know much about war directly. My dad was a World War II veteran, would not talk about it. Finally, 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 before he died just a couple of years ago, finally in the last decade, he talked more. But I knew a lot about social consequences. Finally, I managed to get to their writing workshop, which is held in the last part of June every year. And I'm going to read three of the poems. This happened the very first day, very first day I was there. It, it has um, 
it has italics to show the inner voice. And I haven't figured out how to do that, so I'm going to do this, just to let you know where the italics are. It's called impact. Across the room, someone, a man, says the impact of war falls hardest on women, on wives of men who are drinking themselves to sleep. Mine is not the only sharp intake of breath and totters. Behind me, a woman's voice, but we shine the armor I, the muscles marching in the parade, and keep the body of suffering buried, the tally of our own breakage blank. Tears thicken my throat, none of which helped our father much. I knew I had come to the right place. <laughs> I knew I was going to get help that I really, 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 really needed to, uh, to be brave. This next one owes, owes a great deal to the younger veterans that I have been getting to know there. Um, It is wicked hard to read. But they help me write it, and you will help me read it. <laughs> Checking for emptiness. He heard his name called in alarm by one of his men. In a house they checked for emptiness. And when my father stepped through that doorway, a German soldier filled the hall. At once, he struck that stranger's body, struggled to free his bayonet, failed, then fired as trained. He had hardly begun to carry that damage, heavier by far than the shrapnel sealed in his leg. When I was born, three years later, through a childhood I owed to that death, my father there, but not there, leaned on the wall in the dark end of our hallway, waiting for something to pass. Then he smiled and opened again the closet for the scotch. Finally, the third year, I was, I was able to write some poems coming. I was, I was, in effect, recovering memories out of a childhood that was largely blank, right? Um, and I, I think if you do the work that you need to do, there is something like, something like redemption. Um, I 
This is called Richard and the Blue Boat. Nights in winter, sent to fetch him for supper, I found my voluble father silent, tuned to the work of his hands. He built first rib by rib, a rowboat simple and white as a farmhouse in Maine. Then this speedboat, fiberglass skin enameled blue, tawny mahogany tail fins, faceted, planed, dazzling as <clears throat> his smile. The best of the ways he silenced memory a nightmare. Better than drink, better than one woman after another. In this photograph taken by my mother, he's climbed up in the boat to do some quick job, his office clothes under a denim coverall, and he throws a grin over his shoulder to the sweetheart of his youth. Because he built this boat, and I rode it with him, I remember the view he loved of the cliffs from half a mile or so out. Their green, swooping tide line of woods. The best of the ways we sat down together. Almost no talk, as he faced like a happy dog into the wind with his cap slanted high. Thank you. I'm going to read just one more. It's the one that that Cheryl sent out in the email. Um, it is good also to reach into the future, yes? Yes. We can't only do the work of the past, although obviously I disagree with the people who say just don't go there. Um, but this is my son-in-law, Mike, talking to my, my first grandson when he was very new. That means this was written 11 years ago. But it, I, I don't know a poet with a slower process than mine. You know, I just don't. So there it is. <laughs> it's okay. I'm learning that whole time, right? I'm learning. Um, so Mike almost handed me the first stanza of this poem. And we, you can never account for all the debts of a poem. You can't, right? We don't put footnotes that say, <clears throat> this second stanza owes a great deal <laughs> to 50 years of conversation with my favorite physics major, Alex Brown. But that's true. So here, I'll say it. Mike talks. Abe. He begins to tell about fishing, how they'll do that together. Then he thinks, wait, I have to tell him what a fish is. A large mouth with flesh behind it. A stretch of muscle spangled with scales. And about water, where you swam, little fish before we all welcomed you into air. It will take time to make sense of boats, how things fall through water, how water can be death. But a fish hovers like magic, and a boat settles onto the water like a body on a bed part in, part over. 
he falls silent. Abe sleeps again, a warm weight on his chest. Explanation drifts on out to sea, and he too sleeps. Thank you so much. My mother's neck, pond side, dozing. I am homing, ever homing, floating homeward toward the far, far haven of my mother's neck. Crooked there, rocking, so long, so long ago, her brown hair soft, soft as feather down, swaying dark and down, down across my face. Great blue heron stabs the pond awake. She is shifting, shifting, drifting shaggy-necked, gray. I think my mother's neck. I think grief, looming nearer, ever nearer, leaving soon, no haven left to seek. Thank you. Oh, but I